Well, Matt, thank you for taking the time. Uh, first of all, we really appreciate it. I know with the season starting, you're, you're super busy, but we very much appreciate it. Um, with April being Autism Awareness Month, uh, we wanted to talk to you about, of course, Recliff, the Matt Pack, uh, but most of all, your, your friendship with Reese Blankenship, which I know a lot of Braves country probably already knows a little bit about it, but maybe some don't, so we wanted to talk to you about that a little bit. Reese is not uh, uh, non-verbally autistic. Is that the, mm -hmm. the right term? Okay. Yep. Um, how did you first, let's, let's start at the beginning. How did you first get to know Reese and start working with him? And how did that friendship form? So Reese's older sister, Darren, and I were in the same grade in school. And, um, you know, around middle school, a bunch of us started hanging out in a big group, a bunch of guys and girls, and we would always go over to their house a lot. And um, that's when I kind of got my, my first glimpse of Reese. Um, he was always there and down in the basement, and um, they would hire uh, people, that, you know, therapists to come over and, and work with Reese. Um, you know, a lot of it like learning-based stuff, but also, um, you know, you just you just had to keep an eye on Reese um, at all times. So if the blanket chips were out doing something, um, their dad's a dentist, and their mom Lou is, um, you know, she had to go to the store or whatever. She just somebody needed to be around Reese, so. Um, that's when I got my first uh, glimpse of him and, and kind of being around him and, and more around autism um, throughout the years when we would be over there. Um, my brother ended up getting connected with them and started working as a therapist with Reese before me. And, uh, you know, just being able to talk to him and, and hear, you know, his experience with Reese, I, I kind of followed it and, and started doing the same. And that's, that's kind of where it all started. So I remember when I was a teenager, I first... I had never even heard of autism. And then I met somebody in high school who was, was autistic. And I remember looking back on it now, I remember feeling kind of bad in the moment because at first I didn't even know what autism was. I, this was my first even ever hearing of it. And then I especially felt bad because I wanted to be able to connect with them. I wanted to be them to feel comfortable around me and likewise me, them. Uh, but I didn't know how to do that at first. It was kind of, it was awkward at first. So when you were first working with him, was it was there an adjustment period for both of you to figure out how to be comfortable with one another? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think every person who, who runs into, you know, an encounter with an autistic person, um, you know, right away, you know, a, a neurotypical person, as Reese calls it, with an autistic person, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not a comfortable exper experience for a lot of people. It's, um, you know, it's, it's not something they've been around. It's not something they know how to navigate or handle. And... Um, you know, it can be a little intimidating and, um, to be able to, to get the experience, you know, one-on-one -on -one close up with Reese, um, you know, these, these are, are people just like, you know, everybody else. Um, there's, there's certain things that they can't control, whether it be body movements or, um, noises or, you know, the, the gap between communication. Um, and it's, it's all things that, you know, these people want to have um, and uh, just want to be treated like, you know, uh, as as we treat everybody else. And, um, you know, that's something I learned pretty pretty quickly with Reese. And uh, I think that's why Reese and I are, are still buddies today is because, um, you know, with, with my brother working with him and me working with him, um, you know, we were never – you know, it wasn't just, I'm working with an autistic kid. It's, it's, I'm here with Reese. Um, I'm talking to Reese. Like I would talk to my brother or anybody. I'm not going to get the same responses from him, especially at the time before we started working with a letter board and, um, <clears throat> you know, but, but sitting there, we go on a walk and I just talk and, you know, normal, like I would with my buddies, you know, at the baseball field. And, um, I think it's important for, for us neurotypicals to, to have that experience with them, but it's it's also really important for, for them to have that experience with us. You mentioned uh, work, him working with the, the letter board. So for nearly the first 20 years of Reese's life, he basically he couldn't didn't have any real way of communicating with everybody. And I know in reading, a, reading about it and, and then watching stuff with both of you guys over the years, learning about Reese's story, up until that point, I mean, I think people who were doctors, whoever, thought he maybe had the intelligence level of a, a toddler, a three-year-old, a four-year-old. And then suddenly, 
I don't want to say suddenly because I wasn't there. I'm sure there was a lot of work that went into it, but he makes this big breakthrough and finds a way to communicate. So just talk about what that was like when uh, that breakthrough happened, especially as his friend. It's it's crazy. I mean, in in a lot of ways, it was like meeting him for the first time. Um, you said almost 20 years. I, you know, um, their their family was was just in shock. Um, and I, I encourage people to, to find a way, find, there's a few videos out there, just, you know, go out and, and watch how he navigates the board. Um, you know, you, you might see Reese around the park sometimes and watch the way his, his body works and, and, you know, you'd think that he's not, he's not there to talk at all. And then he gets a board in front of him and he, he just starts going away and, um, incredibly, uh, smart gifted person who you know like a lot of people told him um you know intelligence of a, of a third grader or, or you know he's he's gonna you know need to be taken care of his entire life and you know those kind of things and um you know here we are now with with reese reese starting up facility on his own vision um essentially calling the shots on everything and and you know, reaching out and, and helping other people who who he, you know, saw on the same path as him, and, and trying to help as much as he can. I read an uh, interview with him when I was reading his answers that he provided, and it's not just that he can communicate; he's extremely intelligent. He's a super smart dude, <laughs> oh, right? He's, he's a wordsmith. I, <laughs> you know, I a lot of times I gotta I gotta pull up my phone and and <laughs> you know look up whatever words he's using. He'll, he'll uh, <laughs> run circles around me with vocabulary but you know it, it's crazy it's it's just you know the cliche of of can't judge a book by its cover um you know there's there's so much going down so much behind the um the the movements and the noises and you're in a room with Reese and you think he's in the corner doing whatever and he's listening to your conversation wanting to hear what's going on with you or um you know, how the wife is or, you know, just the, the smallest things. And he'll walk back over when you think you, you know, wasn't tuned in at all. And he'll, he'll jump right in the conversation. So, um, getting that letter board out was, was, um, you know, a, a really eye opening experience for me. Well, let's talk about Recliff and, and the Matt pack. So I know you have the big uh, casino night here every year at the, uh, they think it's been here at the ballpark the last couple of years, mm -hmm. raises money. So, and you mentioned Recliff is, done in Reese's vision. So just for those who haven't heard about it and the Matt pack, um, here at the ballpark, just, just tell uh, Braves country a little bit about each of those. So, um, yeah, the, the Matt pack is some seats up in the 200 levels, um, that it's, it's, you know, the, the most accessible, um, tried to find a, a kind of quiet spot. There are seats by a little room you can go into because, um, you know, for autistic people, a lot of the lights and noises and sensory things can be a lot and off-putting. And, um, you know, for those reasons, a lot of a lot of people with autism, the families involved, don't have the chance to come to a game. And I think one thing that, that Reese and, and Lou and everybody at Recliffe has, has done such a good job is getting this set up um, and saying it doesn't matter if – you can only take one inning worth. It doesn't matter if you can stay for nine innings. Um, these tickets are yours. Go enjoy as much as you can. Don't feel obligated to stay because, you know, it's it's not cheap to come into a game to, to get food, to do whatever. So, um, you know, if you got a family of four and you're not sure if your autistic son or daughter can make it through nine innings, a lot of families aren't going to, you know, come spend 500 bucks and, and you know a chance of being there for 20 30 minutes um which is totally understandable but kind of you know gives it gives a chance to relieve some of the burdens that that um you know come with come with it and and give a give a, a family and an autistic person a chance to get out in the community and um you know not feel any of that that pressure involved with it and, and just come enjoy you know a baseball game well, that's awesome. Well, Matt, thank you so much for the work you're doing, and thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Well, Brian, first of all, thank you for taking the time to, to come over here today, for being here. Uh, my, our good mutual friend, my coworker, Katie Hearn, uh, connected me with you. She's sure. one of my favorite people in the world, and 
uh, she said, you know, Brian's going to be a great guest if you want to have him on. I was like, all I need is Katie Hearns. Uh, she, if she vouches, then I, I believe you. Yeah, no so, pressure there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're really excited to have you, man. So I want to, we're going to talk to you about a number of things um, with this being Autism Awareness Month and your family and being an A-lister and all that. But I want to start with you okay. and your Brace fandom. So a little bit of background on you and how you uh, how you became a Brace fan. Wow. Okay. Well, um, I'm actually originally from the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area originally. I okay. uh, grew up watching uh, Brewers and Euchre and all that stuff. And But the Braves on TBS uh, yeah. was kind of the story that a lot of people have around the world. Um, but yeah, so, uh, just growing up, watched a lot of baseball. Uh, we moved down here in 2007 after college cause my wife's family was here in Roswell and, uh, yeah. And we've just been Braves fan. We, we have the games on all the time. We, we listen on the fan all the time and we've been a list members since, uh, 2021. Okay. So just in time for the world series. Yeah. I pro- you timed it well, my yes. friend. Yeah. That, hey, I'm just like you. I'm from Virginia TBS kid. So that's what, that's what turned me on to Braves baseball watching on TBS every night. And I will say we actually, uh, we just interviewed Jared Kelnick uh, in Braves fest and yeah, back in Waukesha. January. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, he was talking about, you know, we were talking about Bob Buecher and I said that this is my 10th season with the Braves grew up a Braves fan. And now I've worked with the Braves for 10 years. I'm fortunate I get to be around ball players and some famous fans and all that good stuff. And I don't really get starstruck. I'm always appreciative of it. One of the few times I got starstruck in this job, starstruck in this job was 2021 NLDS. I was in the press box. I looked over in the visiting radio booth and there's a clear, there's clear glass. You can see into the booth from the press sure, box. Yeah. And I looked over and went, Oh my gosh, that's Bob Buecher. Yeah. I, I, I like got this. Oh my God. It's like, it's, felt like I was like the museum just came to life or something. I was like, it's you. So it's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. My wife actually grew up next door to one of his daughters. So she knew Bob Euchre growing up. I had no idea. We didn't meet till um, after college. But uh, so I didn't get that closeness of that. But I was just like, you live next door to Bob Euchre's daughter. That's so cool. So uh, to me, I mean, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 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 Mr. I, Belvedere, all that stuff was just like, I don't know. It was yeah. just, it was cool. Harry Doyle. Like, yes. Uh, oh, Harry League. Doyle. Oh my yeah. gosh. It's yeah. the best. Yeah. yeah. So good. Okay. So, uh, moved here. Oh seven became, I mean, now you've been a Braves fan a long time, watched on TBS. So yep. what, what, um, what point did you decide? You said you start, became an A-lister in 21? Yes. So yeah. what, what, got, what caused you guys to, to make that choice? Well, um, my office used to be across the street from the stadium. Uh, we were actually moved into the building that just got torn down to build the Henry right now. Um, my office uh, was on the fourth floor, and I could see through the outfield wall into the Braves dugout from my office. So oh. it was just kind of one of those things. We're here all the time, um, and... You know, it was hard to work during day games, so we'd always kind of just take off and go across the street and whatnot. But uh, I figured I might as well uh, get a package. So we, we only have the partial season package, but that's what works for our family. We can't necessarily get to every game. but uh, And I know they don't offer them anymore, but it's been a great package for us to work for our family. So Yeah, yeah that's great. We love that. Love to hear that. So how, how have the Braves impacted your family? I mean, I, I know we've wanted to talk to you about and i know you sent me a little bit of background about your your family and your Mm -hmm. children so um what is it like bringing your children to games and just how is that that how does that experience of being an a-lister impact your family oh well um i got i just got to say that katie and i believe it's taylor guy in the accessibility services department have been great for us for Many years. I actually served on the accessibility committee when the stadium first opened, so I don't know that they don't really have it officially around anymore, but we helped kind of shape some of the accessibility options and around the stadium. I'm an architect during the day, or day job, and uh, so I know a lot about the physical things you have to do to meet accessibility, which are code and things like that. But um, it was just one of those things that they were great at letting us kind of give a tour of the stadium so that we could get our son familiar with things. Um, and they have a great social story available for, uh, anyone on the autism spectrum or even not that just basically kind of preps kids and young adults for coming to the games. So it kind of gives you the little step-by-step of everything that may happen, uh, uh, about noise, about things like that. And they've been great about giving us, uh, kind of tips and tricks about where the quiet spaces could be, um, if we need to get a little sensory break. 
and things like that. And we've kind of moved our seats around over the years just to be closer to some of those areas in case, you know, we're, we're taking one of our kids that has, uh, that's on the autism spectrum there that we can escape out to guest services in 111 or the Monument Garden or wherever we need to go. That's great. And yet you have two children that are, that are on the autism spectrum? Yes. Yeah. I have four children in all, but uh, I have two children on the autism spectrum. Uh, my oldest, especially, needs has a rare craniofacial disorder called Apert syndrome, but he's also, uh, he's kind of moderate on the autism spectrum. He's verbal, but uh, has the tics and has a lot of the sensory things that, that go along with autism. And he's kind of the one that's more difficult to deal with. And then our daughter is seven, and Elena is kind of on the higher functioning side of things, what they used to call Asperger's mm -hmm. disorder, but it's kind of all been um, under the autism spectrum disorder uh, umbrella now. And, but she's got some escapism kind of things. So it's nice that you know, you're, you're in the stadium, you can be in certain places, but she just likes to hang out in the Monument Garden all the time by the fountain and everything calms her down if she ever gets overwhelmed with anything. So it's that's, great. That's wonderful. So uh, yeah, and they, that leads me perfectly into what I wanted to ask you next. What are those sensory areas like, you know, to somebody like me, like I don't know, you know, I'm about to be a dad for the first time. So sure. getting to learn about all these types of things are, are great learning for me. W what are those sensory areas like? What are the, ser the areas that, that are most helpful to them and how, how are they calming to them? For us, it's more of a, they, they need to get out of the, the loudness or the, the, the sea of people, I guess. So, <clears throat> excuse me. We, uh, we tend to like the quieter areas or something that has something that they can kind of stem off of or where they're stimulated by, say, the water coming down the, the rocks and everything in the Monument Garden or just being able to kind of shut off all the other sounds of things around them. Um, so it, it's just sometimes when you're in the crowd, especially if you're in some of the sections where you've got cover over you and you've got the speakers right above you, it gets really loud in some of those areas which is great for hearing the announcer, but not necessarily great for a kid on the autism spectrum who's getting a little overwhelmed by too much. So a lot of it's just quiet, removing them from the overstimulus. And, you know, there are other things that are, you know, it's just, it's just them being able to self-regulate and get back to a kind of calmer state of mind. Does, does the family, do they enjoy coming to the games? Do oh, yeah. Good time? Yeah. 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 Um, it, it's just, we don't get often all six of us because four kids and it's a lot and my wife and that it, it, it's a lot of juggling. It's, you know, we're zone defense instead of man to man. <laughs> right. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it's it's fun. They love it. We come on special occasions or we tend to send it in the upper deck on a lot of those um, just because a little more freedom, a little more room around to go. Uh, there's still some great areas up there that you can just kind of get away behind kind of home plate and everything up there on the top deck. Um, otherwise we go and we go down by Hope and Will's Sandlot and, uh, my daughter loves to run back and forth on that base path, just nonstop. She'll just run herself silly and, uh, and loves it. And, and, you know, it just gets them out there. They love being out in the open and enjoying the game and uh -huh. getting hot dogs and peanuts. And oh know. yeah, of course. Yeah. So I, so I, I've spent most of my home games uh, in the press box, which is up there on the upper level sure. behind home play. And I honestly think one of the things I love about this ballpark, I think the view of the field from the upper level yeah. is as good as you're going to find anywhere in baseball because you're, yeah, you're in the, you're at the top, but you still have an amazing view of the field right. and, and you, you know, don't, you don't feel like you're a mile away either. Exactly. You know, no. Yeah. I grew up in, in, you know, up North and going to white Sox games in what's now, I think guaranteed rate field or something like that. Whatever. Something new, like com that. new Comiskey, whatever is what I, my <laughs> right. dad always called it. <laughs> right. And we went in the upper deck and you're just like way up there. You just felt like you were a mile away. Yeah. And, but yeah, yeah. Here it's great. So there's, I don't think there's a bad seat in the house here. So I think I know the answer to this question, but based on your family's experience here um, and your situation, would you recommend coming to Truist Park for other families? Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. For <laughs> sure. I mean, everybody needs to do their prep. Uh, I know everybody's kid on the spectrum is going to have different needs and things like that. But, yeah, definitely. And you can reach out to the accessibility team, and they're they're great at working with you and kind of figuring out what you need to know and and it's, it's great. Do your kids have any favorite players? I mean, there's four of them. So I, do they share a favorite? Do they each have their own favorite? How does that, how's that work? They're, yeah, they're, they're, it's a, it's a little all across the board. Um, I know Elena loves 
Travis Darno. It's like she thinks he's the like cutest dude in the world and <laughs> loves when his hair's sticking out of his batting helmet. Um, Annabelle, who's our youngest, who's five now, used to love Dansby, and she would just yell from the upper deck, "Go Dansby!" And it was the cutest little Muppet voice ever. But, she, but now she's again on the the Travis bandwagon. Um, my uh, middle son. Uh, Christopher is absolutely in love with uh, Michael Harris. He wants to be a center fielder. He's a lefty. He pitches too, and he knew that Michael pitched uh, when he was younger as well. And so it's just one of those things. He and he's born on the 23rd of April, so 23. Oh, awesome. It's it's like the syn synchronicity of whatever else like that. And Isaiah loves blooper. I think more than anything um, because <laughs> Me I mean, he's not a player, <laughs> but he's in a jersey. And for Isaiah, I think that all equates to everything else because he'll just sit there and laugh and laugh and laugh at everything he does. Blooper might be my favorite too. We've got a team literally like littered with all stars, but Blooper, Blooper. If, if, if Blooper is in the conversation, I, Blooper might be my favorite. Blooper's desk is very near mine, okay. so I get to see Blooper every day, and Blooper's always on. So nice. I'm, I think he's. I, I might be contractually obligated by Blooper <laughs> to say he's my favorite. At this there point. you go. That's great. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Have they ever uh, they gotten their picture with Blooper? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we haven't done the Christmas card stuff, but we've done, uh, we've come to the to the meet and greet that's out in Hope and, uh, or yeah, out in the outfield there. Oh, in Blooper's uh, clubhouse, clubhouse out there. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what it's called. Yeah. So, and we've done that in, uh, I think, some of the Fan Fest stuff or the um, Play Day member list uh, Play Day. We've, we've done some stuff with Blooper. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. Well, with April being Autism Awareness Month, for our listeners, what are some resources or organizations just that for, if we're looking for more information or they want to get involved with autism awareness, are there any any resources or places you would recommend, organizations you would recommend? Yeah, there's, there's a ton. I mean, Autism Speaks is one of the big ones that pretty much everyone knows about. Um, there's other smaller, like, grassroots things. I mean, uh, I, I know Matt Olson's involved with ReCliff. Um, and, uh, there's ones that my wife actually used to, uh, be a executive director of a nonprofit that serves, uh, young adults and teens on the high functioning side of the autism spectrum called ease club, which was a uh, service of Aaron's hope for friends. So it was kind of this thing that was like a Friday night club for teens on the autism spectrum to be able to meet other teens on the autism spectrum and have a cool, safe place to, to be. And, um, but there's, there's tons of things out there. I mean, you can Google anything you want and and there's plenty of stuff out there but like uh yeah uh that's great yeah yeah that's great well i did want to ask you this because you you mentioned this you and i emailed back and forth a little bit we just launched the inaugural season of braves country baseball and softball yes yeah. and i think you've got a little bit of involvement with that here in the area don't you i do have a little connection yeah um i am actually the commissioner of a 10 uh over at mount Perrin north uh here that is one of the inaugural members of the braves country baseball we just got our uh, bags handed out last weekend so the kids were all excited they had their patches and uh the the hats and everything and the, the little letter from Brian Snitker that was signed that like one kid's like, I got to I got to <laughs> frame this and put this up on the wall. And I'm like, I didn't want to tell him I think it's a photocopy, <laughs> but to them, it's the best thing in the world. So it, it's been great. It's been great to have extra support uh, for the rec league baseball that we're doing and uh, just getting kids more excited and learning about the game. I, I'm so excited to hear that. So my Sometimes co-host Greg McMichael, he's mm -hmm. that's been this has been his program that he's been heading up, and I first heard about it. I mean, we're going a long ways back because obviously to plan something like that, it, it's it's a lot it's of a planning, big, a lot of big ordeal. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's 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 a lot has gone into it, to, which is a bit of an understatement on my part. He's put a ton into this thing, um, so to then see it start to actually it was to see it get off the ground, and you just referenced it there. This is something I would talk with Greg about a lot. I said, you know, me as a kid who was a Braves fan, how amazing it would have been when I was playing Little League. Because I remember the Little League I played in in Virginia, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but I remember I got my first jersey and it had this cool patch on the sleeve mm -hmm. that was the league. And I just thought the patch itself was so cool because it felt like it felt like big league to me. Yeah, you you're know? more official when you have the patch. Yeah. It's not just screen printed on, it's an actual patch. It's an actual yeah. patch. And I thought, if I was a kid that was a Braves fan and I got to have – Braves jersey or Braves patch, like I would be in heaven. And to get a, a, a letter from, letter from right. Brian Snitker, right, uh, is pretty amazing. So that's so cool to hear that the kids are were excited about that. I love, we love to hear that. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, 
uh, how, have y'all had? I don't even know the schedule of everything. Have y'all started playing games yet, or are you still, yeah. still practicing? Where are we at right now? We've had some games, and you know the weather's been a little rainy as yeah. of late, so we've we've had a lot of rainouts. But uh, we've had at least five or six games so far uh, for the team that my son's on, that Christopher's on. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean it's been good. It's been great fun. So. How's what's involved? Like being a commissioner of, a, of an entire oh. ten U league. What's the a lot, of, a lot of happy parents, or how's that? Um, you know? Well, I don't have to deal with the parents that much. It's more of like corralling the coaches and uh, making sure when rainouts get scheduled, if the game's going to be rained out or not, communication stuff. Um, if there's a spat between coaches uh, on some kind of rulings, I kind of have to come in <laughs> and have to be non um, judgmental on my son's team or whatever. I just have to be nonpartisan. That's what I want to say. There you go. But, uh, but yeah, so it's basically just kind of enforcing the rules and things like that. So it's, it's not too bad. It, it could be much worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Well, like I said, I'm about to be a dad for the first time. So I'm already looking ahead to all this. Like I'm going to, I want to be like Brian. I want to be all the things. Commissioner, <laughs> coach. Well, I don't know about coach. I'd be a terrible coach. Uh, Commissioner is more my, my route, I think. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm not a great coach either. I didn't. I didn't play. I grew up playing hockey and soccer, but um, watching baseball, I I got. So I have the baseball IQ. I just don't have the skills to to be on the field well, necessarily. I, I have neither. <laughs> I just love the game. <laughs> I played little league, and it, it did. There was a reason I didn't. Uh, didn't. I became a fan uh, uh, watching much more than uh, than playing pretty sure. early on in childhood. So, well, Brian, thank you so much for taking the time. We love to hear that, first of all, your family's involved with Braves Country Baseball and Softball. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. We love having you here as an A-lister. And thank you just for sharing uh, your experience as an A-lister uh, here at, at, at Truist Park. We're, we're, we very much appreciate your time. No problem. Thank you.